Okay, I think we're I think we're go we're good. <clears throat> good afternoon. My name All is right, I'll talk right now, yeah. No, I'm gonna uh, introduce you. No. One minute, please. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Lyko. I'm here in Ellington, Connecticut yeah. on December thirtieth, two thousand nine to interview Edward R. Kewen, Captain, U.S. Army, World War II. I'm here to interview Ed for the Veterans History Project at Central Connecticut State University, right. an archive partner of the Library of Congress. So with that, I'd like to say good afternoon, Ed. Please tell us about Edward R. Kewen. Yeah, I'm a bit hard of hearing, so I hope I've gotten all the information you want me to give you. To begin with, my name is Edward R. Kewen, K-U-E-H-N. My parents were both born in Germany and came over here when they were 12 and 14 years, respectively. My father was a volunteer in World War I, but was refused uh, the army because he had three children at the time and I was one of them. Anyway, I uh, was born and raised in West Africa, Connecticut and uh, went through the West Africa school system and uh, I went to college at the University of Connecticut, then known as Connecticut State University. There I took ROTC, and it was before that time I had actually taken two years of the 122nd Horse Cavalry National Guard, and I loved that because I loved horses. Anyway, I worked for a couple of years at Travels Insurance Company training to become a field representative, and on the day I had a uh, vacation, I ended up by uh, uh, getting my orders to report to Fort Devens on the 26th of May. That was about seven months before Pearl Harbor. And I was re supposed to report to the regular Army 1st Infantry Division. Now we had three Army Divisions at that time and one Marine Division. And the 1st Division was the only division that was reasonably up to par. I arrived there on a Friday morning and sat outside Colonel Dennis's door while he was on the phone. And uh, opposite me were about 10 or 12 uh, desks with enlisted men and officers on the phones and otherwise. And there was an officer there who picked up his phone, talked to somebody, and really chewed the ass off of that guy. And I thought to myself, what in the heck have I gotten into? So what happened? As soon as he slammed his phone down, he looked at me and he gave me a big wink. Now I mention that because after the war, I didn't get out of the Army. I stayed in the reserve. And I decided to change my uh, designation and I wanted to join the paratroopers. And I took two weeks off to go to Fort Bragg where they had a training program. And while I was there, incidentally, I was denied because of my wounds, previous wounds. I was there, three different army officers, all generals, showed up at the jump area. And one of them happened to be this same uh, Lieutenant Colonel who had shooed. Yeah. And uh, we all wore our old patches that we had other units. And I had my first division pass on my left shoulder. Well, he saw it, and I never even had a chance to salute him. He rushed over, grabbed my hand, pumped it, called me by my first, Ed, I'm glad to see you, and so forth. And we had a wonderful chat together. He was then the second in command of the parachute division. I had been denied uh, going there because of my previous wounds, mostly on my right leg. Anyway, I get back. Uh, we trained first in North Carolina and Florida. And uh, from there, we were sent to Indiantown Gap, 
for uh, movement to uh, Europe. And uh, we were the first combat unit that they sent to Europe, and we were sent on the Queen Mary unescorted to Scotland. And the reason we were unescorted, our ship could go 35 knots an hour, and the known speed of the JAU boats was about 21, 23 miles per hour. We landed in Scotland and had our first taste of British meals, cooking. The um, potatoes were wet and soggy. The meat was uh, cold rabbit and also some cold uncooked peas. Well, anyway, we trained in Northern Scotland. We were sent down to the Medjugorje Babdi, no, to uh, uh, Tidworth, the, uh, the training area of the British. And uh, in there, uh, I had some time to go to London with some of my friends and also see the uh, uh, big, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the uh, uh, big stone of lists that were there, and uh, that was it. We, I was given the uh, uh, job when we were back to Scotland to go uh, uh, up to Eisenhower's ha headquarters with some papers. Actually, they were the uh, uh, loading uh, list for all the ships because we were going to go out. And uh, I could go into a full story there about British intelligence and how childish they were. But I did end up in a, um, a berth in the, not a berth, but a cubby hall in the train, a two-hour ride. And there was a little old lady who was sitting there already. And of course, it was easy to figure out that she was counterintelligent and said I did something. Anyway, under the circumstances, I put everything in my, under my vest and locked it, and I slept while a poor gal had to stay away. <laughs> I arrived down there in London, car picked me up, took me to Eisenhower's headquarters. I was met by a lieutenant colonel, went up the stairs at the elevator to the top floor, and uh, told to hand over my papers to lieutenant colonel. And I told him, nope, my orders were to give him to personal, and said, personally, to General Eisenhower. He was a little irritated, but he got General Eisenhower to come out, and I handed it to him. And he gave me, and he gave me a handshake, and then I turned back. I had been told I would have three days in London as a result of the trip. I flew down, I went downstairs on the elevator, and I was standing there, and I, um, a British command car came up with a general in the car, and a beautiful girl was uh, driving the car. In England, what they did is uh, nobility and wealthy girls were volunteers mm -hmm. on these cars. And uh, the general got out and went upstairs, and she saw me. She started talking and asked me uh, what I was going to do. I said, I'm here for three days. Come on to my apartment. We'll have a lot of fun together and so on. And I'm going to tell you something. It was pretty close. <laughs> but just about that time, uh, the uh, Lieutenant Sternberg from my uh, regiment came downstairs and saw me. And he said, what are you doing here? You, you have to go back right away. Oh, boy. I got back. And when I got back to Gork in Scotland, the uh, regiment had already shipped out. And I rushed down to the pier area, and I found a uh, fishing boat there with a guy in it. And, and the last uh, American boat was slowly moving out. And I asked him if he could take me to that boat. He says he would. And I got there, and they were pulling the cargo nets up. And the cargo net was uh, uh, being pulled by the two. And I got on. I had a my good uniform on, and I barely got over the top. When I got, and I also saw, by the way, from the front hole, a, a wooden casket being shown out. When I got up there, it happened to be my right unit, and uh, I found out that they had made me uh, defense counsel for the 
boy that I shot and killed this guy. I wasn't a lawyer, and, I, and the, the guy who did the shooting was very well liked because he had been hounded by this guy all the time. And what happened was uh, they had put in the, on the fence of him a guy by the name of, um, uh, well, wait a minute, I'll think of his name in a minute. And uh, he had been a, a judge in New York City. Everybody wanted a kid exonerated, and so did I for that matter. Sure. And uh, to make a long story short, I did a lot of thinking. And I got the two, uh, two doctors on board the ship to examine him, and they weren't psychiatrists, but I had them certify that he had mental illnesses and should be sent back to the state. That's how I got out of it, you know. They, well, anyway, we landed in Tidworth in uh, Scotland, had training there, and uh, as I said before, we we're on our way to North Africa. Yeah, in North Africa, at North Africa, uh, we loaded one night. And it was very cold, and we, did, and we headed all the way around outside. And we got down to the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, where you go into, into uh, the Mediterranean Sea. You can see all the lights on in Morocco, but of course in the Gibraltar, black, black, black. And the wind was blowing and everything else. And we were told that the place was loaded with German submarines. And we uh, did our best. Well, we headed out and we got through. We landed in three places. We landed at Oran, which is my unit's place. We landed in Morocco over there. And the other place was Missouri, where the British landed. And uh, at Oran, uh, when we landed, I was in the first wave, but there was no opposition whatsoever there. And uh, I got ashore, and the communication session was stayed on that beach. And I came in, I shoot their asses over there, and they finally got up and went in. We had opposition there. The uh, uh, Vichy French were, were in charge of the key down where some of the boats could, small boats could come in. And uh, one of the uh, companies, if I was K Company, I later commanded, was uh, there, and they had a stiff fight. And uh, we continued up towards Oran itself, which was like about five by six miles inland. And there was a little town called Arzu, which was on its way. It was encased in, in with uh, walls and everything, and they put up resistance. And, uh, and the first uh, uh, guy from my office that uh, was killed was alongside of me when we were hit with uh, a lot of uh, mortar fire and artillery fire from the French. I might mention when we, we took the company, when we took the uh, town, we went into Iran. And uh, I can remember that a few times I was there, they had two gin mills. One was a pretty good one. They had an old hotel, and of course all the buildings were old and ancient, you know, so yeah. But um, we enjoyed a few times here and there. We were then bivouacked outside of Oran about 20 miles and um, in an olive grove. And there were a couple of boys that maybe had Dear John letters or something, or they couldn't stand the war. And they committed suicide. And it's there that I also um, had my musette bag stolen by a little Arab boy who crossed the, the ditch to get to my tent. And I saw him, and I rushed like heck after him, and finally caught up with a group of older Arabs over there, and a kid was running. And in my very poor French that I had from High school, I'm telling them I was going, I was going to get the gendarmerie to come out and examine their village on top of the hill over there and get everything belonging to the Americans back. 
I got my musette back, except the, the uh, cigarettes were gone. They were after American cigarettes. When I got back, Colonel Brown, uh, who was my battalion commander, said, that's it. You're my S2. You're going to be my interpreter from now on. I said, I can't talk much French. <laughs> I was the S2 an interpreter. And I bring that out. I mean, every six months, you have to go ahead and have a fitness report sent in by the, your commanding officer. Mm -hmm. And uh, my commanding officer, the first one was Captain William Bradford McCullen Chase III, who had been named after the two generals. And the other one uh, was Colonel Murphy, uh, Major Murphy, who commanded the battalion. Both of them West Pointers. And um, they both gave me a superior rating. And the rating went up to Colonel Dennison, the, the uh, regimental commander. And he sent it back to both to uh, Murphy and to uh, Captain uh, Chase and ordered them to change it because no reserve officer was worth a superior rating. Now this is what I ran into during the whole war. With a group of West Pointers, they resented the reserve officers. They kept us down. And uh, as a result of that, Murphy, a West Pointer, Chase, a West Pointer, practically told Colonel Dennison to go to hell. Murphy was relieved of a command sent out of the division within a month. The first day of battle at Iran, Chase was revealed, released of his company and sent to the Ordnance Department. They were both gone. And uh, that was a, a little thing more that I came into later on. Well, we're, we're there at Iran, and uh, uh, we got orders suddenly that the British were having real trouble uh, near Tunis at Bizzardi. And uh, we were ordered to get packed up and get over there, 900 mile ride, you know, see. And the only maps we had of uh, North Africa, the one over 200,000, you couldn't really see anything. And the roads weren't designated very well. And I was given the job of being a point guard to take us 900 miles. A whole 15, 16,000 men, you know, say. We did all right. First night we were um, in a little village, and it was dark, and we stopped there. And uh, I had the distinction of listening to a mullah, uh, you know, give one of the daily Arab prayers. And it was, it was eerie that you do it in the dark, say. But during the night, a single German plane came over and uh, tried to hit our uh, cars on the road, our trucks on the way. And the uh, division command pa panicked a little bit. And we all had to get up and move. <laughs> well, the next day we headed off. With me up ahead with my Jeep driver, and we uh, hit Constantinople, and I'd love to get back to that city again. And across the desert, and I might mention one other thing, as we're traveling across the Sahara, the desert, stuck in the mountains in the desert, there were two uh, Arabs uh, on white horses and themselves white robes that were like a hundred yards away from us who were racing alongside of us and firing rifles at us, and I say. Uh, but uh, n nothing happened. They couldn't hit anything. We got the, uh, the British here at Major Zelbab, and they were in the middle of a fight already and uh, getting really pummeled. And uh, we were thrown into combat right away. Uh, my uh, battalion was put on the right side, third battalion. The first battalion was on the left, and, they, and the British were on the left of them. And uh, the British had been told that we were there to help them. 
And instead of waiting until we got there, man, pulling up alongside of them, they pulled out, leaving our battalion, our company A exposed. And uh, Captain York and about uh, six or eight of his men were cut off, and they spent the uh, time in Germany from then on. I mentioned that because he was Jewish, you know. So yeah. Uh, anyway, the British, uh, the Germans eventually withdrew, and we went into a th about a 30-day reserve holding force there. And uh, little Major the Bob was completely bombed out. Nobody was there. There was a crossroad for two major roads: the Bazerdi Road on the left side, and the uh, uh, Coastal Road on the right side. And there, it was one of those days that I ended up by being a bit bored. By that this time, I was running a radius too, you know. See? And I went over to K Company. The, the hill in front of us was called Longstop. It was also called um, Banana Ridge by a big, long hill. And uh, probably about uh, maybe two or three hundred yards up. And there was a mosque on it. And you could see the door there, and so it was empty. And I still had a suspicion that it might be used by the Jerry, so, so I decided to take a look at it in the daytime. And I went to K Company asked for volunteers, and I had about three cooks, and, and uh, I did have one good soldier, Sergeant Koenig, who incidentally was killed later on at uh, uh, in one of the battles down below. But uh, we went up, just the two of us. And Kenny was on my right, so I told him, you hit the door, there's probably nobody there. I'll go around the left side. So he, he goes there, and I go around. On the left side, there was a very big bush, about maybe about eight feet around and thick. So I had to go around it. And before I got all the way around it, firing broke out on the right side where Kenny was. And, um, he got in a couple of shots before I did, but the point was, I'd say on my side, there were anywhere from 12 to 16 Jerry's. Some of them must sleep, yeah. and because on the reverse slope, there was brush and some uh, bushes there, and they were there waiting. They obviously waiting for a raid at night on the lines, you know, see. And it, as it turned out, um, Kana killed a, uh, uh, the, the television, not television, the radio man. And that night I had sent out a couple to see what else damage was there. And they took his wallet and brought it back and I almost puked. There was a picture of his wife and little baby girl and so forth, yeah. yeah. But anyway, uh, the firing got damn hot and I had a couple of uh, bullets nipping my clothing, see? And I uh, yelled at him, hey, let's get the hell out of here, it's too hot. Yeah. So he came back, I came back, and going down the hill, they kept firing uh, the small mortars at us. And you could see where they were hitting the dirt, but none of them exploded. Those mortars were being put together in Germany by uh, yeah, by uh, prisoners, you know, see, and we were thankful for that. We got down, got back to our headquarters, and Colonel uh, Brown wanted to know what happened, and I told him, he says, we're going to go down and tell the regiment, because they're curious. They've been sending runners here, want to know what's going on. So I got in the jeep with him, went down there, and uh, Colonel Greer was there, and this lieutenant colonel who was the S3 of the regiment was there. Son of a bitch, I hated the bastard. But anyway, Colonel Brown says, I want to give you, or give, uh, I want to give uh, Lieutenant Q and uh, Sergeant uh, here, uh, Silver Stars, for what took place. And there was, he, this could have been nice. 
And this guy, uh, Colonel Gray, was about ready to say yes. Well, but, but this guy speaks up and starts talking about how, no, the division model was so-and-so. They have to do that. That's their job. They're not entitled to anything at all, you know, see? So we didn't get any silver stars. I mentioned that because the same thing happened at a later date to me by the same bastard. But um, uh, we didn't get it. We went back. I might mention Sergeant Koenig died uh, in a battle about uh, as we were coming north from El Qatar. Probably about four weeks later on, five weeks later on, you know, say, damn good soldier, too, you know. Well, uh, then we got, I got uh, a notice to uh, uh, report to General Anderson, the uh, uh, commander of the British Field Forces in that area, and we were under his command. And I could tell you about their rations compared to ours, what they got and what we got, <laughs> but I won't. What happened was, uh, I was sent to his headquarters to give the condition of our own troops and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I went with my jeep, and his CP was on the top of a knoll. And I took my jeep and rode all the way up to the CP. And at the CP was uh, General Anderson there, but he had his command car, and the command car had a, uh, a little stove in it, it had a toilet in it, it had a bunk in it, it had a uh, washer in it, and so forth. And as soon as he saw me ride up that hill just like that with my Jeep, the first thing he wanted to know whether I would swap my car for his. <laughs> and I said, uh, no, I can't. But I said, you're a general. I said, all you have to do is put in that size now, and I'm sure you'll get a Jeep. You know, and that was it. It was there, I'll remember another thing. I was asked if I wanted some tea. And I forgot that, that you know, British custom. And I forgot that the tea always come in hot. <laughs> and I said, yes, I'll take the tea. And they bought tea, and I took a sip and almost burned my throat. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget it. But I did meet Gerald Anderson, who was one of the better British officers, yeah. Went back, and a few days later on, we got call, uh, called and told to pack up a million and go south. That uh, uh, Patton's uh, division was being smashed by the British, uh, not by the uh, uh, Jerry's. Yeah. And uh, we had to get down there and stop that, you know. And we drove all night. I got there probably about maybe three o'clock in the morning, and our orders were to uh, dig in, stay in the foxholes if the Jerry Tanks came through, and wait until the, uh, the uh, infantry followed the tanks and then knock them out, which was smart because the British didn't do that. I mean, Americans didn't do that. Yeah, that's Patton's tank. Yeah. And one reason why, we had the big Shermans there. And their turret only went about one third, and uh, they were heavy, they were cumbersome, and the and Jerry's tanks were light, they were fast, yeah. and they had a big circle, and, they, and the boys knew how to use them over there. Yeah. And, and Patton's uh, division, old of it, he was no longer commander, uh, had about 2,200 tanks. And the Jerry's had knocked out almost 2,000 of them. And that's why we had been yanked down there. Well, when we had our battle the next day there, we stopped them and they were pulled up, pulled back. And they stopped them because we stopped the, the, their soldiers following that tank. They, and then Pattern later on boasts that if every unit had fought as well as his unit fought that he had trained. We wouldn't have had any problems there at the Catherine Pass. That was the second reason why we hated this son of a bitch, you know, say, yeah. And there we were. Well, uh, it continued down. And all I can tell you is 
all the way down to Matur, which has got close to the uh, ocean line, we had about six or eight major fights. One was at Sapetla, and one was at a place I call Hill 104, but that's not the number, maybe 144 or something like that. It's the first time that we had a National Guard uh, division in combat with them, and they were on the left-hand side of us, and uh, they got clobbered pretty badly. And we got there, yeah, we got pushed back and forth. And they'll come that I, I had been in before with a new company commander, Captain Fogg, whom I would gotten to know and liked. He was killed. Uh, Billy Cross, a uh, lieutenant uh, platoon leader, uh, was hit by a, a heavy mortar shell and blown apart. Sergeant Penzik was killed. These were all men I knew, you know, so yeah. And in the second uh, battalion, uh, Dennis Ford was killed. These are officer friends of mine. All of them, you know, see. And we really had uh, a problem there. But when I was told that by his runner that uh, Captain Fogg was badly wounded, I got up to go help the guy. And Colonel Brown was my battalion commander. And he pulled his uh, uh, Colt 45 out, and he said, you stay here. Don't you go there. And I paid no attention. He cocked the 45 and put it on me. I'll kill you if you disobey. No, I didn't go. I didn't go. But uh, I couldn't have done any good. I couldn't. Have. I might also tell you, one of the instances there, the, um, uh, there was a plane that uh, was shot down and happened to come down right in front of us. And yet, when we were able to uh, get through there, he, uh, the plane pilot wasn't there. He must have jumped out somewhere in the back, which is all right. It was a German plane, you know, so yeah. I also tell you that we had a kid in our company that uh, took some of the plexiglass from the uh, windshield of the plane, and he carved them and cut them up into something. What he did is he, he took a little piece and he made a cross, oh. and he gave it to me to send to my wife, you know, they, uh, wow. and I did. And I don't know who's got it now, whether any of you girls have got it or what the story is. Oh, yeah, special. that was it. But well, that was a rough fight, too. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we get all the way up to Mentor, which is the last major battle we're going into. Uh, Tunis, and on the right hand side, the other side of the uh, Longstaff Mountains, and on the, uh, we call it the um, uh, Coastal Road, where we had finally forced uh, uh, Ramel's forces to use, instead of the Bizzardi Road, uh, they uh, uh, had gotten to a point that they knew they were licked. And they were pulling out of Tunis into Sicily, you know. And uh, uh, that's where Captain Raymer got killed, company commander. And Colonel Brown turned to me and he told me, you, you take over, you're company commander there now. So I took over, and we had about, about four or five days of heavy fighting yet before we broke through. And then he also told me, he said, look, now let your exec take over now, because we'll be going out of here. And I want you to get into Tunis and see, we had lost about eight or nine guys by capture. And uh, see if you can pick up your K Company boys. So I followed the British line on the one road all the way in. And uh, going the other way and over uh, fields and everything else, where German trucks with German prisoners, so they're all cheering because they want to go go to America, you know. They, we got into uh, Tunis, and going down the road into the center of Tunis, uh, there were a lot of uh, civilians there, including girls and everything else. And I was the only American, and. Uh, God, they come over and grab me and hug me and kiss me and everything else. We got pretty close to the bottom of the road, 
and there was a gin mill there, and I could hear some singing going on. And I had my chief driver wait a minute. I said, I'm going to go in and see if I can find out where our boys might have been uh, put, you know. I go in there. The place was back with officers, Italian officers, German officers, French officers, American officers. British officers, all of them having beer and singing, and their favorite song was Lily Marina. <laughs> there we go. I found out where our boys had been held, and that was my job. I went over there and also found out that they had broken out and were on their way back, so I went back with them, you know what I mean? And then we stayed at, um, uh, back to Iran again. Uh, where we had first landed, you know, and uh, we were going to train for invasion in Sicily. Can you cut it off? Yep. You want to take a break? Okay. I just wanted to take a drink of coffee. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. We did some more training in the Iran area for invasion of Sicily, and it was during that period of time that the uh, Bob York, who was the battalion commander of the second battalion and a West Pointer and a terrific soldier. And he and I had uh, developed a uh, report together. Uh, I think it was a sort of a mutual respect for what we did when we were in combat. So, yeah. And he was good. Not to digress too much, but I want to mention that uh, as the years went on, uh, he was put in charge of the invasion of Guatemala. And of course, that was a successful invasion. Mm -hmm. He also became uh, General Westmoreland's chief of staff. And each time he went, uh, he got up. He was in his third star when, when we were there. And he was in charge of pulling the troops out of Vietnam. And he was given a fourth star for that. And he was brought back home to Washington. And he was offered the fifth star in charge of all of the military establishments of the United States. Terrific soldier. And uh, he resigned from the Army. Mm -hmm. And instead, he went on a speaking tour all through the South. He was very, very much upset with our actions in Guatemala and in Vietnam. We should never invade either one of them. They weren't communist countries, and they were just poor countries, and some damn dumb president had ordered it, you know. See. He came to one of our uh, reunions at Washington, D.C., the officers' reunions, you know, and he, once a year. And he and I happened to be there, and that's the first time I'd seen him since the war. And we sat and talked to the guy for at least two, two and a half hours. How wonderful. He's a wonderful guy, and he and I, as I said, really melded together, you know. So, and I think that's one of the things I got out of the war, that he respected me and I respected him. Okay, now, uh, I'll tell you, also, he, he got cancer and he died. That's too bad. Well, anyway, here we are, and uh, this is in Oran, and he uh, contacted me and asked me how about going in, having a couple of beers. We hadn't been into Oran. I said, sure. So we both grabbed our Jeeps, and we were both took one of our junior officers with us, and we headed into Iran. Every single place in Iran was off limits to the Mediterranean base section only. All gin mills, the hotel, all stores, everything. And uh, we were there to get some beer. He hadn't had beer for over a couple of years, you know. And uh, in front of the best uh, gin mill, the cock door, the golden rooster, 
It was a big, tall MP with his rifle. And we went there, and uh, uh, Major York just pushed the guy aside, and we went in. And in the far corner were about six officers from the Medicine Bay base section there. One of them I remember particularly, he was a rather short, plump lieutenant colonel, and then there was a full colonel there too, and some small, lesser ones. They were drinking beer. The bartender was behind the bar, and uh, uh, Bob York went and asked for beer. And he looked at the generals and the others, and they said, no, I give them wine. You could buy wine for two dollars or five gallons. Yeah, we didn't want it, no. And uh, we didn't know we wanted beer. And so Bob York jumped over the bar and started handing beer to uh, all of us, uh, the other three of us. And we stuffed them in our pockets and our hips and shirts and everything else. And then the, the other group got up and started coming to us. And as I wrote in one of my uh, excerpts over here, I could still feel in my right hand the feel of the punch I had when I punched that lieutenant colonel right in his gut. I'll never forget it. And anyway, we go out of there, hop in our jeeps and head back laughing and drinking our beer all the way home. Of course, they ended up by Captain Stockton Eisenhower with their story. And I had not got in touch with Terry Allen, our division commander, who was a little firebrand boy, and uh, told him to find out who had done that and that we should be severely disciplined, even broken in rank. There he is, see? And uh, Terry Allen, as I say, was a firebrand. He told Allen, they're very blunt and go to hell. He says, I lost a lot of men here and taking this down, and if I have to, I'm gonna go back in and take it again. And his solution to the problem was, he ordered the regiments under his command that had access to Iran to go ahead and go in groups of five at all times, and don't get pushed out of anything, just go in. And that's what happened. Well, tell you what happened. Latter part of the Sicilian campaign, Eisenhower was released, uh, not Eisenhower, Terry Allen was released and sent back home to the States. And that was his place for dissipating Eisenhower. Yeah. He was too good an officer at West Point, a firebrand. And what he did is he got in uh, a hole of a uh, reserve division and in a short period of time, he trained it, got it up to par, and got it good enough that when we had the Battle of the Bulge, he got his division back to France and in, in the Battle of the Bulge. And they fought very, very well. He was a good man. And uh, I always liked him too, you know, so yeah. Well, Getting back to Sicily, we got aboard our LCI landing craft infantry, and my whole company was on one of them. And my little skipper was uh, a guy who had been a, a clerk of a bank out in the Midwest. He had never seen the ocean before he got in the Army, and they had trained him to be a skipper. We also had uh, the worst storm in the Mediterranean. They had had in 50 years. Oh, it's terrible. All my men were down in the hole. They were sick. Oh, they were showing all over the place. I went down to check on them, and I almost slid off the top step yeah. for all the puke that was there. And I went back up to the, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, the, uh, where you look out with the glass panes and everything else. And the, the uh, waves were coming over, hitting our glass. And the rear of the boat was out of the water about 20 feet, and the two screens were out there going. It was terrible. And I had visions of the damn thing breaking up and almost going. 
and so did the young skipper. And he asked me, he said, don't you think we better go back? And I told him, you know, I've got my orders. We were told we had to go. I haven't heard any denial of that. We're going. We keep going. And boy, I was thankful though that when we hit the Sicilian store, we were supposed to land on the right side. Elk Company was supposed to be on the peak of the hill. We were being on the next to them, see. Somehow the them uh, crews, the skippers of the two landing craft, uh, got screwed up. And we ended up on the left side, on top of the hill, overlooking the jail airport and jail over there. And uh, they were on the right-hand side. And anyway, we got up on top of that hill first. And we pushed back, uh, mostly Italian, and they didn't really want to fire. We captured some of them, and that was it, you know. They, and we knocked out a, uh, they had an old 75 millimeter um, artillery piece there. It was worthless. Yeah. They also had fired all their shells, but not too many of them. And they had a big hole where my communication section ended up by being in there together. And I hit the hole where the, uh, the gunners apparently were. It was fairly deep. And that was probably about uh, oh, from here to that next house away from me. Now, part of the plan had been that uh, we had a cruiser there to support our invasion. And the cruiser was supposed to help us take the hill area above the airport. And nobody got to them to tell them we had already taken the hill. And we were getting peppered. And one shell, a shell hit uh, my communication section. And those are the five inch shells, that, you know, they sink battleships. And you couldn't even pick up a fingernail, they were blown to pieces. Wow. And, and that same shell that was there so close to me, my nose bloodied, I got concussion, uh, I hurt. I heard, and that's why I got this, and I'll say, yeah. I also got this because it, it also uh, knocked out one third of the retina in my eye, and I'm blind in this eye. Well, uh, Jack Raycard, who was uh, Battalion S3 at that time, noticed that going on and knew we were up there. And what he did is he contacted the regimental headquarters immediately to get the damn cruisers to stop that. Yeah. And the cruisers did. Well, what's going on in the meantime? L Company on the right uh, ran into a German machine gun nest. And uh, one of the boys that was killed had been the boy who was my Jeep driver when I was battalion S2. He was an 18-year-old kid, the only son of a uh, widowed mother. And uh, he had begged to go on the service, and she finally had given up and let him go. And I knew that she would had trouble. And uh, the uh, officer who had ordered the uh, final assault on the machine gun nest was that same son of a bitch who denied my silver star as I didn't care to everybody. And I found that out, so. And I'm there on my little safe bay, which is a mound of rocks, and open in front of me, and uh, myself and, and about two enlisted men, one, maybe one other, and uh, I, when I found that out, that uh, my little guy had been killed, I brought out, who oh, was a goddamn fool who ordered a final assault on a machine gun head. I didn't know it, but that Lieutenant Colonel had come in, and he was on the edge of my CP. He said, I did. You take your company and knock it out. And I saw him. I told him, you bastard, 
I says, I'll do it myself. I won't sacrifice my company, see? And she didn't say a thing. I sent my running back to get a couple of uh, supporters, and he came up with six of them. I uh, volunteered, you know. And I said, I don't want them. I want you two over there. I knew they weren't married and to come with me. And I explained what I was going to do. I was going to work myself around and come up in the back and the waddies and so forth. And uh, I only wanted two of the guys, and I made sure that they had the rubber soles on and not the, uh, the leather one. The leather ones are noisy on the racks. And uh, they, I sent the others back. I worked myself around, and uh, there was a uh, young German soldier, there was a paratrooper, who uh, was there sitting behind his machine gun, wide open fire. He would have gotten an awful lot of my boy. And he would have been dozing. Yeah. And I ended up by uh, getting close enough to him. And the second language I had taken in college had been German. So I had French, I had German. So I yelled at him, Achtung, and he almost fell over. And he got up, and I said, Hand on, cop, put your hands on your head, you know, which he did. And then I told him to turn around and walk in that direction, say, uh, meaning my CP. And when I was talking to him, he woke up and he started yelling at me, you're German, you're a traitor, you're a damn traitor, so on so. <laughs> I laughed, I told him, I, I'm an American and my parents were American too, you know, just because I could talk a little drum. We get back to the CP, and he's still swearing at me, and I kicked him in the ass. I might tell you, that's against the Geneva Convention, too. But I didn't think about it at that time. I was damn, uh, he kept calling me a traitor, what have you. And the uh, lieutenant colonel there, the guy I hated, I looked at him, you know, and I said, all right, I said, you saw what I did? I said, there's nobody hurt here in our side. I said, you're a damn fool, a damn fool. You shouldn't be in the Army, you know. He didn't say a thing. I said, if I was a West Pointer, you'd make damn certain that I would get the Congressional Medal of Honor, yeah. which is true. I might also say that after the war, he came to the officers' reunion in Washington State one time. He had about six big rows of ribbon, about that much, four and eight. Where the hell did they get them? <laughs> no France and uh, yeah. all over the place, the Italian and what that, you know, they, uh, And I looked at him, oh, I says, you really saw a lot of combat. He didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 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 well, anyway, then I told my uh, runner to get my lieutenants, I wanted to have them uh, come up and uh, I uh, take my eyes, we were going to advance. We were going to be the point guard of the division. Mm -hmm. And they came up, and I gave my orders, and we started out. In the next three days and nights, we probably had about five, six brushes, maybe seven brushes. Didn't sleep, of course. Didn't eat, of course, yeah. And um, the brushes were mostly about against the town. There were a few times that some juries were involved, but the Italians were all easy to give up. It got to a point that when they come down with their rifles, I'd have them throw the rifles on the ground and walk to the rear alone. And I didn't even send any of my men with them because I didn't want to lose any soldiers, you know what I mean? We got up to Villa Rosa, which is a little town at the top of Sicily, and it's really a uh, uh, den for uh, uh, the mafia. American mafia were there, they're all there, you know, see. Uh, and uh, down in the valley in front of my company, because I had already gone over 
on the top right to continue, uh, were two Jerry tanks on the road which was facing us behind the uh, ravine. Behind the ravine, I say about it. Uh, a little more than a quarter of a mile away. And uh, I got orders to hold up. And I did, but what bothered me was uh, one of my platoons, my best platoon, was exposed. It was in a rather open space. They uh, threw them hole up and dig in, uh, all of them. And uh, we were told that we would be put in reserve because they had been three days there, you know. And uh, I'm there writing a letter home to my wife. And uh, I got orders to appear at, at uh, battalion headquarters. Now, my company is the first away. And, uh, damn it, that's hot. And uh, my company was the first away, so I was the last one to get there. And Joe Sisson, my battalion commander, made his system, had already given orders to L Company to uh, move out because uh, General uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Assistant Division Commander, had ordered a reconnaissance and force. I didn't have much respect for his military knowledge. I had respect for his guts and so forth, you know. They, uh, and he was crazy because they, uh, he knew from my reports back that uh, we were facing the Jerry's already. We're going to lose some men, see? But as soon as Joe Sisson saw me, he had already given orders to L Company. He said, oh, Ed, you're here. He said, I want you to, to take this job over. I said, what are you talking about? And he ended up and told me what it was. I said, for Pete's sake, Joe, we were a good friend. I said, my men have been three days in a row and three nights they haven't had a hot meal yet. I says, they're trying to put on some fresh socks. I says, why don't you let L Company go? No, he says, I want you to do it. I want you to do it. Son of a bitch. I called for my lieutenants and told them what was happening. And uh, I also told Joe, I want everything I'm asking for is I want the 32nd field artillery. I've got to do some saturation bombing there, because I don't know where the hell their mortars are, you know, see? And he says, you'll get it. I'll make sure they give you things. I get back to my company, and we were supposed to jump uh, off at 3 o'clock. It was the five minutes after 3, and we hadn't jumped off yet. And one reason was no artillery observer was there. I had no barrage that I wanted. And um, I had to jump off, because that was the order. And as we started to move, the Jerry shells began dropping again, including mortar shells. And um, over the hill came this young guy who was the observer, his first day in combat. A nice looking guy. He came over the hill exposed but he came down to where I was behind this mound. So if he had been smart, he'd have come around like that, you know, see? And I told him what the story was. And I says, I don't know where the hell those mortars are. They can be anywhere with that brush. They can be behind the tanks. I says, I want you to give me some saturation bombings. Can you do that right away? He said he would. Then I turned to uh, look uh, at my communication and make sure they were all right because the shells were running, coming close. And he turned, and instead of laying flat on his stomach going up the hill, he exposed himself. He walked right up, and the next thing I knew, a shell came in. He was killed, and uh, I got hit. I got hit in the shoulder, and I got hit in my leg. The uh, uh, the mortar shell went through my metatarsals. I have five metatarsals, started up here, went through, all the way through, 
until it came out uh, underneath my fourth and my fifth metatarsal. Mm -hmm. And uh, through my shoe. And this was about maybe four o'clock right, by that time. And uh, I told my uh, radio man to phone Joseph and tell him I'd been hit and send my exec to take over and continue the fight. What had happened in the meantime, the division had finally gotten smart and had not gotten the information to us and had called off the reconnaissance and force. Well, I lay there until, until just about midnight and I figured that uh, the mission, the bearers had been able to locate me and I probably lay there until morning and uh, might not make it, you know. They, uh, but just about midnight, the litter bearers found me and they, they hauled me up over the hill on the other side of a, of a hill where there was an ambulance. And in the ambulance were three guys, two of them wounded and the third, third one was a lieutenant, Lieutenant Bob Moore. And Bob was one of my friends that you might see on the picture there. They, uh, he had cracked when he had heard I had been hit. And he had really broken down. I uh, might tell you I did something I shouldn't have done. After I was at a point sometime where I could write a letter I wrote to his family and I assumed that he told him that he was going to have pulled back and so forth. I told him that he had uh, had some uh, problems when I got hit and he, was, he had been reclassified somewhat, but this was normal and that he had done a, an excellent job as an officer and so forth. I never heard from him or his family again. I'll never forget it, yeah. But I did read in one of the newspapers from Ohio where he came from that his daughter had won some uh, uh, awards in a horse show. They had horses. He was a wealthy kid, me, mm -hmm. among other things. Well, look at on. I'm down there at the um, field hospital, and I'm laying there, and just about 5 o'clock in the morning when the dusk is getting away, the former platoon sergeant, I had, Sergeant Thompson from Elk Company, showed up. He had given up about maybe five hours of uh, very necessary sleep uh, to locate me. He had found out I had been hit. And uh, I almost fell over here there. I told him to tell the boys that this was only a flesh wound <laughs> and tell them I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Don't worry about it and so forth. And he turned to me and says, no. He says, you won't. He says, you got a pretty bad head, and you're going to be sent home. I said, what? You're going to be sent home. Oh, what had happened was, um, oh, and then he also said, the reason I'm here, he says, to tell you, I've been in the Army a long time. You are the finest officer I've ever served under. I'll never forget that. That was my Congressional Medal of Honor, you know. Absolutely. And I told you later on in the battle in France, in the Hurricane Forest, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor himself, yeah. And there you are. Well, the officer that operated on me, I was operated on a, uh, say, a, a hospital, Bed with a piece of plywood and two buck horses with a lamp hanging, kerosene lamp hanging from a tree, you know, like a branch. And uh, he also told me he was going to give me sodium pentothal. He says, you you can say, start counting, he says, but by the time you've counted up to four, you'll be out. Well, what happened was, I counted up to 14, <laughs> and then I said, oh, shit, <laughs> and I was out. And the next thing I knew, I woke up back on my bunk, you know, I say, uh, 
He's quite a guy. He came in and talked to me. I found out that he had volunteered uh, for the service provided he could be in the front line uh, helping. He was a surgeon, mm -hmm. helping wounded boys, you know what I'm saying. He came from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He was a good man. One of the things that the uh, rear echelon always valued was that Jerry had a hand pistol, which designed a lot like a Colt 45, except for one thing. It was a P38, and it was a lot lighter. And it also uh, worked a lot smoother. And uh, the higher officers, if they ever could get a hold of one of those, would throw their 45s away and take the P-38. The tradition was, if our officer was later on captured with a pistol, they'd take it away from him and kill him because they knew the only way the officer gave up that pistol, he had been shot too, you know, see. And I told him to stay the hell away from the front line because of that, yeah. So there we were. How long should I? Well, tell me about meeting Patton at the hospital. Didn't he come visit you when yeah, you were I'm going to ask you. Uh, I've got uh, two things I should go back and talk to you about, and they refer to Patton. When I was uh, still in North Africa, one of the major battles. I was sent back for a rest to uh, Corps Headquarters. And uh, I'm there laying on the ground in a little oasis. And uh, our regimental uh, platoon uh, commander, uh, Colonel Mason, was in a tent going over the paperwork for our comments. And, I'm lying there trying to take a nap, and I started hearing some sirens. And up the road came uh, these four motorcycles with sirens on, blasting the atmosphere. And mine that was the command car with Patton standing up, a la Mussolini, and uh, uh, coming up to our area. And behind that were about six, six or eight uh, photographers and his own men, you know, see. So when he got to our area, I jumped up. And I'll tell you, about a week before, Patton had issued orders that all officers had to be shaved every day. We didn't have any water. All officers had to wear their, all people, had to wear their helmets at all times. In addition to that, all officers had to wear their ties. They had to have their rank and insignia shown on their helmets. Poor Colonel Mason came rushing out to see what was going on without his helmet on him. And there's Patton. There were a couple of listed men that were on the ground sleeping the same as I tried to. And he ended up by chewing Patton out. And that was completely against military protocol. That was Patton. the reason I hated this son of a bitch. Now, when I was in the hospital, and down on, in jail yet, before I was shipped over to the um, Tunisian side by plane, and I uh, lay in the tent uh, at the corner with the flaps open because their tents were hot. And this was in the daytime one time when the old fat ass showed up again. And this time he went into the next tent. And in that tent, there was a boy from the 26th Infantry, which is our third regiment of the 1st Division. And uh, when he had come into the uh, Army, he weighed 176 pounds. He was now 124 pounds. 
he had had black hair when he came in, and he was white-haired, and he was a bunch of nerves. And Patton saw him, and, where are you wounded? And the guy said, I'm not wounded. Patton slapped him in the face and told him, get up, you yellow bastard over there, and fight like a real man, you know, see? I was there, I heard it. Now, one of the uh, reporters was also heard, and this reporter <coughs> ended up to write his, he wrote his paper in the United States and wrote the story. And Eisenhower got a hold of it, and got a hold of Patton and chewed his ass out, made him find where that uh, soldier was, and go and apologize to him. Patton, you know, even flew home to see General George C. Marshall. Marshall was one of his supporters. <laughs> and he tried to get Eisenhower relieved of command so that he could take over. But that didn't happen. Uh, I could go on and tell you a lot of what happened to me after the war, but is this about it? Well, I, I don't want you to you know, get... Yeah. Did you well, all right, I'll tell you, I tell went through uh, reunions, I went through 11 different hospitals. Okay. I, uh, and uh, one of the hospitals, my promotion to captain, finally came through uh, about 11 months late. If I had 11 months, I would have gotten a term relief promotion to a major, but I didn't have it, and uh, I retired as a captain. And what happened, I became uh, the, uh, I became the uh, company commander of a company at Fort Bragg. That was the worst company at the post, and uh, they had an average of eight to ten AWOLs a month. And the first month I was there, there wasn't a single AWOL. And as a result, I think part of it, we had a night, uh, maneuvered, and I had arranged with my mess hall, and they almost fell over. Now, when I, my company came back, they had a single donut, every one of the boys, as well as a cup of coffee. They had to have it. And some of them were used to go home to their wife, you know. Good. So when we showed up and they had that, I was God Almighty as far as my company was concerned. <laughs> and General Logan, uh, I was general because his family had donated the land for the Logan Airport up there in Boston. And he used to come down to my company every single day to watch what was going on. And one of the things that happened uh, was that uh, uh, he ended up apparently by recommending to Colonel Bear, who was a regimental commander that when uh, the uh, lieutenant colonel, who was a regimental S3, and got orders to ship overseas, that he should take me, the captain, as the regimental S3, which was a lieutenant colonel's job. And I was shifted to there. Now that was nine, uh, uh, nine uh, battalions, Four companies apiece, 200 men per company, and six and six officers. So you can figure the number of men I had responsibility for. And I pitched in, and I did a pretty good job. As a result, Colonel Bear tried to get me a jump to Lieutenant Colonel, and it came back completely denied because I didn't have my time in grade. You know, I know I didn't have time in grade, and. Uh, he told it to the generals, and the two generals ran, wrote a personal letter to Marshall, the same way to get me at least advanced to a major, you know. So, uh, and again, the reply was that they had so many uh, lieutenant colonels being shoved back for prospect for discharge. Use one of them, you know. See, no way, you know. See, I opted to get out of the service. I had already uh, uh, enrolled at uh, Bull Harvard and Yale, and I was going to law school. And uh, both of them had admitted me. 
And uh, when I put in for a discharge, I had the fourth highest number of points of the 1900 offset at Camp Croft. Uh, they, the two generals called me up to their office, and I reported in, and they were behind a big desk sitting in two chairs, and they had a chair in front of me, and them told me to sit down. Then they put the pressure on. Uh, they had arranged with Washington that I could be made a major, and that I would uh, have a permanent rank of captain, but a temporary major. That I would go to the command general staff school at Fort Leavenworth, and uh, if you went to that school and got out successfully, the uh, tradition was that you would become a general someday. And they were trying to get me to stay in the service, you know. They, I was married and I had a child by that time, although my oldest daughter, Marie. As part of my CMTC and, and ROT service, I had run into a, a girl. I wasn't engaged to any other girl myself yet. Uh, by the name of Penelope Moore, whose father was the uh, uh, major general in charge of Fort Peace up along the Canadian border. And uh, she was a real clean-cut girl. She knew the rope because she was an army brat, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> all right with me. And we got along. We really clicked pretty well. And a matter of fact, her story to me was she would do anything to get out of the Army. She had uh, lived in something like about 19 different uh, Army posts, and she didn't lie. She could never make any friends. And every place she went, every guy was trying to rape her, you know, see? And uh, she wanted out. She'd rather have a home somewhere small one with a husband that came home at night at five o'clock, have a couple of kids, and she could have friends. Well, of course, that could have gotten further, but I, uh, I did, like I like, I was uh, still in school, and I was going to a girl that I later on married. And uh, one time I'm home at my house in South, in South, yeah, South, uh, in South Windsor in uh, West Hartford, and I got a long distance call from Chicago or Detroit, and it was Penelope. Ah. And uh, I said, how the heck did you get your number? And my number, she says, I did a lot of research to find out where you lived and where I could get your phone number. She says, I'm out here with some friends. She says, I'm still thinking of you. Uh -huh. She says, how close are you to your other girlfriend? <laughs> I said, it's getting closer. Uh -huh. Well, she says, I was hoping. She says, I want to come back. She says, I like you. That's the last time I heard from her. You know, that was it. Well, anyway, as you know, I went to law school. I graduated with a uh, Doctor of Laws degree uh, with the highest uh, mark in my class. I had a very successful early career uh, doing trail work. I made a lot of money until I realized I was getting quite deaf. And I had to shift my emphasis to estate planning, real estate, stuff like that. And my income went from a quarter of a million dollars to down to about 50000 And I was putting three daughters through college, four grandsons through college, and I had to slow down. That's the, I did have a, a successful political career, and I met with, uh, later on, the President Jack Kennedy when in the, there was talk of uh, running me for Congress in this area. And uh, I told him that I was having hearing problems. But he said, uh, he told John Daly later, he says, I want this, this boy to go to Congress. He says, he thinks the same as I do. Uh, I'm going to tell you, Kennedy was brilliant as far as I was concerned, yeah. yeah. 
So that was it. Uh, anyway, I didn't go to Kahn. I went home and talked to my wife. And all I could think of, I'd be two weeks at a time uh, down there, have a day back here flying home. I had three daughters by that time, you know, no way. So I cut that out. From then on, my legal career went down, and I quit after my wife died, you know. So that was about 20-some years ago, see. That's my career. All I can say, I'm deaf now, 95%. I've got a blind eye. i got a lousy heart. I've had a series of mild heart attacks, and I've been told that if I have a major attack, I'll be gone. I also uh, hurt myself in a skiing accident, my right shoulder, and I've got a torn rotator cuff with bursitis, and approximately a month or so ago, I broke my left shoulder when I fell. Yeah. I heard about that. And that's the sack of Ed Kuhn, wow. but he did produce three wonderful daughters, okay. four wonderful grandsons. This is all for now. Okay, Ed, I want to thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor to hear about your incredibly, incredibly exciting and interesting military career. And I am, I am just blown away by and impressed by what, what you've been through. So I, I want Not to thank on the you. Tape. I want to thank you from Central Connecticut State uh. University the Veterans History Project, and the Library of Congress. Yeah. All thank you for this wonderful interview. Let me you be, turn it off. Okay.